Hey folks, this is the ASRock Challenger RX5700 XT, a base level AIB partner card which by all accounts does the job it's supposed to, performing better than the reference cooler models, but it's one that does require a little bit of massaging in the software side of things to get the best out of it. Cheap, lightweight and a typical no frills entry level AIB card. As a little recap, the last time we looked at this card, we undervolted it to not only raise the average clock speeds in game, but also drop the temperatures which was well worth doing. A few of you had brought up the question in that video if there was anything else that could be done to further enhance the performance without going mental. So that's what I've done by using the age old trick of adding some small washers to the mounting mechanism at the rear of the card. The idea behind this is very simple if you're unfamiliar with it. The washer adds some extra depth to the assembly, in this case it's only 0.5mm, which in turn increases the mounting pressure, meaning in theory you're going to be getting better contact with the heatsink assembly and the GPU die. Since the last video using the Challenger, my Ryzen setup has found a new home, in the Lian Li O11 dynamic case, with a newer tweaked Wattman profile, so the baseline for this video is in this case rather than the older Corsair 500D you might be familiar with. But as you can see, across the board, those washers do help drop the temperatures a little bit further. GPU edge and hotspot temperatures drop by a few degrees, which is always appreciated. So with this Challenger card, we've undervolted it in software, set up a more aggressive fan curve, changed the thermal paste to thermal grizzly cryonaut, and increased the mounting pressure between the die and the heatsink. An entry level AIB card pushed as far as it can be without drastic modification. So the real topic of today's video isn't about dropping a few more degrees with some washers, today we're certainly going to ask how does an entry level card tweaked to the max hold out against a higher end card using the same GPU. And to do that we're going to use this, the Sapphire Nitro Plus RX5700 XT which ticks all the boxes you would expect for an upper skew showpiece card. Comparing the two, there are a number of really obvious differences when it comes to how it cools that Navi GPU. First up, the Challenger is a true 2 slot card, whereas the Nitro Plus is more of a 2.5 slot. The Challenger comes in at 281mm long compared to the Nitro's 306, a little bit wider at 137 compared to 135, and is only 42mm deep compared to the Nitro Plus's 49mm deep. That means that the Nitro Plus offers 25% or so more volume. The extra size on the Nitro Plus means that instead of the two 100mm fan arrangement we get on the Challenger, we're instead afforded two 95mm fans and one centrally located 87mm fan, helping push more air through that heatsink. On the topic of the heatsink, the primary heatsink weight on the Challenger comes in at 289 grams, whereas the Nitro tops out at 413, a 42% increase in weight. Now the Challenger does actually use larger diameter heat pipes here, being 8mm and instead of the Nitro 6, but we'll only get 4 of them and for a shorter distance compared to the Nitro's 5. All in all, the volume of the heat pipes on both cards are fairly similar. Both cards, nicely, feature a secondary heatsink for cooling the memory chips, and on the Challenger's case, the VRM. The Challenger though has a heatsink that weighs in at 48 grams, whereas the Nitro comes in at 70 grams, 46% more. The total weight of the heatsink on the Nitro is 483 grams compared to the Challenger's 337, 43% more weight in the heatsink. So it's clear that the Nitro Plus model is a much higher thermal mass than the Challenger. What this should mean in the real world is that it's going to take longer for that heatsink to become fully saturated, meaning that you can run the fan speeds lower for longer and it should just have an easier time cooling that Navi GPU. But at the end of the day, on paper hypotheses don't really mean much if it's not backed up by real world data, so let's see how the tweaked Challenger compares to the stock BIOS, the more powerful one, on the Nitro Plus. Running through a 3D Mark stress test on both, there's very little to separate the two when it comes to what's delivered on screen. Audibly though, the Challenger is considerably noisier than the Whisper Quiet Nitro, with my custom profile being higher than what it ships with. It's not obtrusively noisy, but it is over 40 decibels. While the FPS difference was nothing stark, the clock speed was actually noticeable. The stock Nitro averaged out 1964 MHz with a peak of 1996, whereas the tweaked Challenger settled in at 1882 MHz with a peak of 1942. 
Voltage, though, was another story entirely, with the profile on my Challenger seeing it peak out at 1070 millivolts, whereas the Nitro Plus rocketed up to 1200 millivolts and spent the vast majority of the time guzzling over 1100 millivolts. The difference in voltage obviously translates to a difference in power draw too. On average, the Challenger shipped away 186 watts, whereas the Nitro Plus averaged above 27 watts more than the tweaked Challenger. More power used means more heat produced, so how does that affect the card temperatures? Let's take a look at the problematic hotspot first, the highest reading of any one of 64 temperature sensors spread across the die. And when looking at this value, well, the Challenger puts up a really good fight. Remember, although the fans are spinning faster, we do have considerably less thermal mass than the Nitro here, and both cards can spin their fans up much higher than I've set if required. But from here, well, things take a pretty dramatic turn into the stock Nitro's favour. General GPU temperatures seen the Challenger average out at 72 degrees compared to the Nitro's 63. GDDR6 temperatures are a good 10 degrees cooler on the Nitro Plus Guard 2, despite the Challenger starting at a lower temperature thanks to the higher minimum fan speed. And it's a similar looking story to the VRMs. Looking at the graph, it looks like a wash, the Nitro peaking at just 62 degrees compared to the Challenger 76. But really, both these are good results, and you should only be concerned about VRM temperatures if you're well above three figures. So in closing, and looking strictly at the results here, the answer to whether or not the highly tweaked entry-level Challenger can match the stock thermal performance of something like the Sapphire Nitro Plus, eh, the answer is well, not really. The question we probably should ask though is, does it actually matter? And that's where we get the last minute curveball thrown into the equation. Yes, the high-end Nitro is objectively better in nearly every possible metric. More features, better cooling, higher clock speeds. But that extra 60 or so megahertz on the GPU clock speed, well, it just doesn't really translate to anything tangible in games. I mean, we're realistically talking about an extra frame or two on a good day. And when even at 1440p, the Challenger 5700 XT tackles games with aplomb, if it's tangible in-game performance you're looking for, then there's not really much to separate any of the RX 5700 XT cards one from another. So what it boils down to is simply this. Tweaking an entry-level AIB card can return cooler temperatures and technically better performance than it ships with which is fantastic, it likely won't match the cream of the crop in terms of noise or thermals, but all these cards are going to be roughly on par with each other when it comes to in-game performance. So it's really got to be up to you as a buyer if you value the lower noise of a better, more expensive cooling solution over the additional cost to obtain it. At the end of the day, the Nitro is a fantastic card. It looks great, it performs really well, and keeps everything cool. The Challenger, well, it performs better than a reference RX 5700 XT, and it generally costs a good bit less than the high-end cars like the Nitro. So it is going to be up to you to decide where your real value lies. Now, I think I'm going to wrap up this curiosity of a video for now. We're going to need to take a deeper dive into the Nitro Plus, as it is a really nice card, which deserves more of a thorough look. But for now, I'll just say thanks for watching, and I'll see you all in the comment section down below, and in the next video.